Welcome to God Pods, Faith Conversations from Boston College's Church in the 21st Century Center. Hello, and welcome to God Pods. This is Karen Kiefer, Director of the Church in the 21st Century Center here at Boston College. We are so excited for this conversation about grandparents because they are the true bearers of our faith. They hand on our faith, and it is a miraculous gift. I'm excited um, to announce that the Church in the 21st Century Center is launching the Grace of Grandparents campaign. We'll be having more conversations over God pods. We'll be featuring faith feeds. Um, we'll be presenting more articles and more information. And I'm excited to say that we'll be partnering with the Catholic Grandparents Association, which is an international association um, that was founded by Catherine Wiley 20 years ago. Um, and we'll also be speaking with Marilyn Henry, who actually works on the, um, the association in the United States. I can't wait to learn more about the association with you and also learn how you can get more involved. So let's get started. I welcome Catherine Wiley and Marilyn Henry to the C21 Center's God Pod. Welcome. Thank Hi. You. So <laughs> So great to have this conversation. Um, Catherine, you're coming to us from Ireland, and Marilyn is coming to us from Texas, and Zoom is making the world just a much smaller place. <laughs> yeah, well, it's remarkable. Grandparents are now able to access Zoom so that we can all be together. I think that's one of the real graces of the COVID pandemic, is that in many ways it's forced us to do this. And my God, it's just wonderful, Karen. Thank you so much, so very, very much for seeking us out during this bleak time, these strange times when grandparents stood by feeling helpless, you know, inside their windows, looking out for the first times in their lives, not really being able to help. And depending on our children and our grandchildren, to help us and to look after us. So I think it is a remarkable, grace-filled moment that has brought us here together on this program because perhaps if it hadn't been for COVID, it wouldn't have happened. So thank you, Karen, and thank God. No, indeed, indeed. And you know, our center, um, Catherine Marilyn, uh, the mission of our center here at Boston College is to be a catalyst um, for renewal of the church. And um, we're very much focused on, on handing on the faith. And we know the influence of our grandparents and, and helping us hand on their precious faith to the next generation. And, but I want to go back in time. Let's go back 20 years, Catherine. And, and what was the God wink moment when you thought, hmm, we should really start to really focus on grandparents and, and the, the importance of them handing on the faith. Karen, it's like so many other things. It never started off like that. There was never any, any intention in my mind or any thought in my mind to start anything like this. I was uh, a businesswoman uh, working with my husband for over 40 years. We'd, we operated American-style summer camps. We stole the idea from America and pioneered it in England. And thank God and thank you, America. Um, it, it, it was very successful. Um, and we retired. We lived in a village called Walsingham in England, which is the shrine, the national shrine village of Our Lady. And um, it's a thousand years old in history. And the history of Walsingham basically is that our Holy Mother appeared to the very wealthy widow and asked her to built a replica of the home where she had received the words of the incarnation, the message of the incarnation. And so the widow set about doing this and that has survived for the last thousand years. And so Walsingham is a great place of pilgrimage. And in fact, we live in an old friary. 
uh, we're very, very blessed. It's uh, very blessed indeed. We live in the ruins of a friary, which is 700 years old. But I have to say again, it was all, none of this was worked out or planned or, or anything else. When we found this old house, we were living in London, very, very busy lives, and we had very little money. And we were looking for some place to, to go to week, for weekends with the children. So we found this house in Walsingham, which was owned by the National Trust, which means that it's also open to the public. And we were fortunate to get the house. So we'd lived there for years and years, and we had become very friendly with the Marist Fathers. Marist Fathers and the Marist Order were really sort of foundation stones of the Catholic Grandparents Association. And there was a man called Father Philip Greystone, who mentored me for 15 years until he died. And I thank him and I bless him to this day. Because there it was that, that, that everything happened. I mean, it was, and very simply, I was at Mass on Our Lady's birthday on the 8th of September in the little slipper chapel where all the kings and queens of England over the years have gone to pray, including Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. Um, and I was wondering <clears throat> what I could give Our Lady for a birthday present for a gift. And I was wondering idly, you know, what did she do on her birthday? Did, um, you know, did her mother bake her a cake? Did, did St. Anne and St. Joachim buy her presents? Um, and then I wondered later on, what did Jesus give her for her birthday? And then I thought, what could you ever, ever give our mother, the woman who had given us absolutely everything? I mean, what could ever be good enough? And into my mind just came the idea that a pilgrimage to honor her mother and father, St. Joachim and St. Anne, the grandparents of Jesus, would not only please her, but would delight her. Mm. So without further ado, uh, remember I've been living in the village for over 30 years and everybody knew me and the marriage fathers were my friends. We started the first grandparents pilgrimage ever in the world. Now it was extraordinary You think of, there's pilgrimages for everything but there was no grandparents' pilgrimage. And the pilgrimage, basically, was in honor of St. Joachim and St. Anne, the grandparents of Jesus, and to honor and thank all our grandparents for all they had done for us down through the ages, particularly in the transmission of the faith. And I'm sorry it's such a long answer, but from that, from that pilgrimage grew Catholic Grandparents Association, because I certainly had absolutely no idea of what I was doing. I would never have considered myself to be a holy person or, um, or, 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 you know, I've always, I'm an absolute cradle Catholic from Ireland, completely cradle to the grave, um, live and die the faith. But I, I had just become a grandmother to my step-grandchildren. Huh. And I had not realized, I had realized the difficulties of, living in a divorced family situation. And back in those days, it's not nearly as common as it is now. And it was very, very difficult. And we'd, we'd managed very well until um, it came to the, the birth of my step-grandchildren and followed quickly by the birth of my own granddaughter. And I, I, I began to realize that being a grandparent was really not anything like I had imagined it. I thought that I told that the joys of being a grandparent, which I experienced, the, you know, the heart, the feeling, but I had no idea of the responsibility of being a grandparent, and what that meant. And it quickly came to force when I was told that my first grandchild was not going to be baptized. And I, it was a real body blow to me. It was a, it was something that I had never imagined in my life. Mm. And then as the years went by slowly and we moved the pilgrimage from Walsingham to England to America, I met so many grandparents who were saying to me, but you know, my children have fallen away from the faith, but my grandchildren are not baptized, but my children are living together, they're not married, but um, you know, I don't know what I did wrong, but I feel that I have failed. And I felt the same way, I have to say. So we wrote to Pope Benedict at that point, and we asked him to write a prayer for grandparents. 
which he did. Mm. Because, you know, I looked everywhere, I sought everywhere. We, we have by this stage initiated quite a new pro few projects for grandparents. The pilgrimage was an enormous success. But it wasn't until Pope Benedict wrote the prayer for grandparents that the CGA, as we call it, Catholic Grandparents Association, was formed. Because there is nothing in the world, there, there's no way that a holy a pope can write a prayer at the request of grandparents and grandparents not to use it. Mm -hmm. And the final paragraph in that first verse of the Pope's prayer says, make them teachers of wisdom and courage that they may pass on to future generations the fruits of their mature human and spiritual experience. So the, the way was paved, Karen, for us. Yeah. Um, many people joined me who were absolutely conquered by what was happening in their own families. They'd lost their confidence. Our church, particularly in Ireland, was being absolutely hammered by the media. There was no good news at all. Mm -hmm. They just hung on to the bad news. The bad news was that our younger generation had totally missed the beauty of the gospel. And the only people really who could share that to them were the grandparents. Right. Right. So that, that's the basic story. That's the basic beginning. But if it would, had not been for Pope Benedict and um, the lightning speed of the pilgrimages and the incredible enthusiasm that everybody latched onto this as something to bring gra grandparents back mm -hmm. into the full. And Karen, when I read your beautiful book and I saw your drawings of God, your latest book, um, it reminded me of our first beginnings because for me, it was a great conversation opener. It was a great um, introduction. What does God look like? Who is God? Is it Jesus? Um, when you think of the grandparents of Jesus, it also inspires, it's a great conversation opener because so many people don't know that Jesus had grandparents. And they don't think about it. They don't think about them. Grandparents themselves didn't realize they had a vocation. And that vocation, of course, was to pass on the faith. Mm -hmm. And so I immediately saw synergy, and so did Marilyn, in, your, in what you're doing and what you have been doing, you know, with 21st Century Church and the way you're trying to renew the faith and that you'd finally come around to grandparents, which is just extraordinary. And I have to say, I know that Marilyn is sitting there listening to all of this, I met Marilyn in... Um, yeah, let's bring the, Marilyn in. <laughs> yeah, Marilyn, I met Marilyn in Philadelphia at the World <laughs> Meeting of Families. And Marilyn changed the face of the Catholic Grandparents Association of America. Her devotion, her devotion, her dedication, her passion. I mean, Marilyn is Polish and I'm Irish. But I tell you... <laughs> we're both Dutchess. Somewhere, <laughs> somewhere along the line, we were cloned because... I've met anybody more similar to myself than Martin, Martin Marilyn. We can fight and we can argue, but we are as passionate as each other. And together we have really, in the last four or five years, forged an incredible path for grandparents. Now, tell us a little bit, both of you, that is, tell us a little bit more about the pilgrimages, like how, how they began and, and, you know, what did they look like? And, and, and then how did you start to grow that vocation as part of the association? Well, you know, Karen, the first thing is that grandparents never thought they had a vocation. I never thought I had a vocation. I thought only priests had a vocation. Mm -hmm. It never occurred to me that we had a vocation and that I, and nobody had ever told us. I can never remember as a child growing up, and I wasn't lucky enough to know my own grandparents. I only knew my grandparents. Um, when we started with the pilgrimage in Walsingham, as I said, we had the American uh, summer camp company then, and we had hundreds of children from overseas. So we brought them all to Walsingham for this first pilgrimage. And then um, I, I knew it was a natural to take it to Knock because I live in Walsingham in England, but I also live very close to the National Shrine of Our Lady of Knock, which is in Ireland. And um, just around that time, 
they were calling a first pastoral assembly in the Archdiocese of Tum, where which is my archdiocese here in Ireland, and they were looking for lay people to help renew the church because of the lack of priests and the bedevilment of the church and the way it was being treated by the media and and, 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 and all that we know went along with that particular period. So we'd started the pilgrimage in Walsingham and I thought, well, this would work in Ireland. So I got myself invited to that conference at the last minute with only one intention to find out about starting a pilgrimage at the National Shrine of Our Lady of Knock. <clears throat> and again, it's a long story, but it happened. And it happened with the great support of the Archbishop of Tum, Michael Neary, who is our Archbishop here in this Archdiocese, and his then assistant, Father Finton Monaghan, who became a bishop. So you see, Karen, if you work with us, great things can happen. You become a bishop, the Pope's write prayers for you. Um, so Bishop Finton, uh, I mean, I'll never forget that first pilgrimage knock. It was heartbreaking to get off the ground, and I've never... You know, I really, I've never had more gray hair in my life. Thank God for L'Oreal, Clairol, and all the rest of it. Um, it was worse than COVID. <laughs> but I remember going into the Basilica with Father Finton in the morning. And I said, Father Finton, what do you think? And he said, oh, Catherine, he said, I've been up all night worrying. I have no idea. What do you think? And we, walk, we walked into the Basilica, which holds seven, 8,000 people. And the Basilica was jammed packed wow absolutely you couldn't get a pencil between the people and so from that first pilgrimage in knock um which is now the biggest pilgrimage in the history of knock in 150 years when we have 10 12 000 wonderful grandparents every year and uh, an incredible group of people who put everything together and the shrine of knock itself who responded so enthusiastically. Um, there's a wonderful rector there called Father Richard Gibbons. And there couldn't be better to us. And I always found, Karen, somehow or other, that nobody could say no to the grandparents. If you asked them anything and you said, it's for grandparents, the answer was automatically yes. Mm. It's like people had, everybody has this deep gratitude and this deep raw love, as they say in Ireland, for their grandparents. I know that um, we did a survey recently, uh, not a good few years ago now in Ireland, and it showed that 73% of vocations were influenced by grandparents. Wow. And you show me any young person these days and they'll say, who taught you your faith? Grand, granddad mm -hmm. took them to mass. So it, it was almost, honestly, Karen, it was almost with lightning speed that this association got rooted, took place, moved on. I mean, when I went to Rome to ask why the Pope hadn't answered my letter, and I asked him to write the prayer. <laughs> God Almighty, forgive me, the arrogance of the Irish <laughs> and the persistence of a grandmother. Um, I had written three letters by then, and I was absolutely couldn't understand. Um, but um, when Rome saw what we were doing, they called the first plenary assembly for grandparents, which they invited me to as a guest. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, there have been many, many pilgrimages and seminars and conferences and congresses in Rome um, under the Archbishop of Sakella, who is head of evangelization, and now Cardinal Farrell, who is head of um, marriage and family life. And they have opened doors, they have there's nothing they haven't done to help us grandparents. Wow. You know, I was, yeah. going, to, I was going to ask you, you know, what, what was the grace of the pilgrimages in the early days, but you just answered that. And so I'm thinking about um, knowing that, that our, our God is a God of surprises, that you continue to be surprised as the association in these pilgrimages just grew. And, and the, the need was great, but, but uh, you know, the community was there. And um, what were your thoughts about moving 
are expanding to the United States. And was that when you met Marilyn, um, as you mentioned, um, you know, in Philadelphia yeah. seven years ago? Is that when? We've had a home in the States um, for over 20 years. Um, remember that when we brought our, when we, um, our business was American Start Summer Camps. Yeah. So we spent a lot of time in America working with summer camp directors and owners on their sites to, um, to learn from them. And again, the Americans were incredible. I mean, they were incredible. We were, we were just two young kids. We didn't know very much. Mm -hmm. and, um, they helped us in every possible way. So we lived in Florida and Palm Beach was my, 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 my archdiocese. And there's a wonderful bishop there called Bishop Barbarito. So I went to see him. And also, there were other connections along the way, Karen, that just fell in place. Like there was an Irish priest in my diocese um, who knew Donna, the singer. I don't know if you know Donna Rosemary Scallon. You know, she sang with Pope John II. She made Our Lady of Knock famous. Um, well, when we had our first pilgrimage in Knock, the Shrine of Our Lady of Knock, I never wanted it to be just a pilgrimage. I wanted the pilgrimage for grandparents to be the most beautiful event that you could ever offer Our Lady. I wanted the most beautiful music. I felt we needed the young people to sing, um, to bring back the old traditions, children in their Holy Communion. We had a children's prayer appeal to write children's prayers. Thousands of schools and children got involved in what is now something which is worldwide, mm -hmm. the children's prayer appeal. Um, the graces just flowed in. Mm -hmm. But Karen, I have to tell you, I was very, um, you know, I'm not very versed. I, I have no degrees in theology, I mean, or anything like that. And I didn't even really realize what graces were. Mm -hmm. People would say, oh my God, you're, you're showered with graces. These are the most wonderful things. The fact that grandparents left those pilgrimages totally energized, elevated, um, bursting to pass on the faith, to acknowledge their faith, to show the love of their faith. And, and the fact that there was this great celebration mm -hmm. in the National Shrine of Our Lady of Knock in Ireland that said to all the people of Ireland, look, here are your grandparents. Here are the people who have, through blood, sweat and tears, mm -hmm. passed you on this faith. Mm -hmm. A faith now which doesn't seem to be as wanted or as needed. Mm -hmm. but you only have to look at your grandparents to recognize how did they get through their lives. Mm -hmm. And when I look at my mother, I mean, she had 10 children. She had no washing machine, no dishwashing machine. She grew the vegetables out the back garden. She dug them up herself. You know, she knitted cardigans. She knitted jumpers. She got us all to school. She fed us. And she's not the only mother in the world who was like this. Mm -hmm. When you think about what our generations before us have done to bring us to this point, by, and simply, Karen, by telling the story. Again, I go back to your drawings of yeah. Simply by telling the story. If you forget to tell the story, you've lost it. When um, a very famous rabbi was asked, how did the Jewish nation keep their faith during the Holocaust? He simply said, they never forgot to tell the story. Mm. Yes. Very so we have, we have the most wonderful story ever told. The most wonderful. You know, when, when my grandchildren who are grown up start picking on me and picking holes in the Catholic Church, I say to them, okay, fine. Find me one story, one story in the gospel that you can criticize. Just find me one. Prodigal son, the healing, the mercy, the love, the joy, the forgiveness. And we got that. That's our faith. That's what's been handed down. That wisdom, that understanding, that, that deep knowledge of if we hadn't had that to get us to our life, we wouldn't be where we are now. Mm -hmm. well, I think, you know, today... It's needed more than ever. And I also think, too, that grandparents struggle a little bit with overstepping. 
you know, and, and they don't want to offend, especially if um, the husband or the, the wife, you know, they, they're not as interested. Um, but there, it just seems to me that your association offers not only grandparents the hope and to go forward and, and, and share their faith and hand on their faith with gusto to their grandchildren, but it also, I think, tells the world that grandparents matter. They are the story. They are, like, look at their story. And I'm happy to say, working on a college campus here at Boston College, I have lots of discussions with young students, and they've told me beautiful stories about, you know, the reason why they go to church is really, it goes back to, you know, my, my grandmother or my grandfather or, or just a, a, a poignant memory of uh, something that happened in their childhood that, that they're holding on to. And, um, but you know, the, the very uh, priest said it, one of our pilgrimages, I remember once, a great priest, he said, um, you know, you, 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 you forget what people said. And you'll forget what people did, but you'll never forget how people made you feel. And there's that, you know, and when you talked about the art of being a grandparent, knowing when to step in, knowing when to step out, Mm -hmm. knowing when to back off, which it can be the hardest thing in the world, Karen, when you see them going hurtling headlong into disaster and you're tempted to say something, or to interfere, you just have to learn to to bide your time and pray. Um, right. There was a great, right. again, at another pilgrimages, there was a wonderful bishop called Bishop John Hine. He, I remember in one of his sermons, saying that he was at his grandmother's bedside when she was dying, and she was holding his hand, and John looked at her and, 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 and was holding her hand, and she said, John, do you know that I have prayed for you every day of your life? Mm. Karen, when you ask yourself that question, right. who has prayed for me every day of my life? Mm. You know. And when you know who you pray for every day of your life, mm-hmm. but do you tell them? Do you tell them, I pray for you every day of your life? Mm-hmm. Never a day goes by, morning, noon, and night. And don't forget to pray too, even though they might say, oh, so listen, don't forget to go back and say thank you. God likes to be thanked. The small things that have come down through the ages, Karen, but the art, it's much more difficult th- these days being a grandparent than I believe it has been any time in our history. I agree. Because, and to be a grandparent of integrity mm-hmm. because um, society is not what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, we have multicolored, multicultured, multicolored, multi-faith, multi-structured families. And it, when it comes to the grandparents, they are the grandparents of every structure, every type of family. Mm-hmm. And when your child comes to you, you know, and whether your grandson comes to you or your granddaughter, whether they're gay, whether they've done something awful, whether they're, they're getting divorced, whether they're deep into addiction, you have to rely then on the wisdom of your faith to see you through and to see them through. And it's only faith, Karen, that will get you through that. Oh, no question about that. Only our faith. Yeah. And and a lot of people these days are are, are unable to talk about um, the, the, the difficulties in modern day marriage with their children and with their grandchildren. They end up by becoming apologists for their faith yeah. and i think that association like ours when grandparents get together they give each other strength yeah Which you know they give each other strength really fun and- journey you know and i think i think too um grandchildren can have conversations with grandparents um that they can't have with anyone else and there's a grace and a gift in that too You know, and there's just something, and again, I'm not making a sweeping generalization, but um, there is a a grace in grandparenting, you know, and, um, and I I think it's a a beautiful opportunity to be able to hand on our faith and have 
young people actually be open to it. And I know, um, I hope that that's the case with my kids instead of them rolling their eyes and saying, mom. Um, but I, they see my mother and the way that she practices her faith. And, and hopefully they'll hold on to that for the journey. I, I, I want to get into some of the, the works of the association, like boots on the ground. Let's talk a little bit about some of the, um, you know, some of the groups in the United States. Like for instance, Marilyn, could you tell me a little bit about what's happening, um, you know, in Texas or in some of the other states that you're working with um, other grandparents that are kind of getting together um, groups of people talking about our faith, talking, you know, I think you're, you're hosting programs and conversations and, and, and doing a lot of that. And I, I, I asked that question because for the people who are listening, they, they just want to get a sense of, you know, how the association works and then how they might get involved. Yes. I'm, I'm happy to. I am um, a grandmother of 11. My grandchildren range from 22 to five years old. And as we've been talking about, I learned my faith at the knees of my Polish grandmother <laughs> saying the prayers um, beside the bed at night, both of us kneeling on the floor. And to this day, I still do that with my grandchildren, even though they are, some of them are in their 20s. That's our special time together when, yeah. when visiting or they're visiting me just to, um, it's a one-on-one -on -one time. And, and I was like, can I come say prayers with you? Of course, key. <laughs> so they wait for me and they, and, and sometimes it might be um, several minutes, half an hour before I make it to their bedroom. And they're still waiting for me. They're still lying awake waiting for me. So it's the most beautiful thing. And that's, that's exactly how I learned my faith. And I'm, I'm so, um, it's so much a part of me to pass that on. And I think it's, it's a part of um, every Catholic grandparent. That that's, that's the most treasured and the most, I tell, you, tell them, it's the most valuable gift. And the only lasting gift I can leave you is my faith. So I'm happy to do that. And um, I do believe that God put Catherine and me together. I know the first time that I visited Ireland and I was at the Shrine of Our Lady of Knock, um, it was a, an incredible moment. Um, it was on Divine Mercy Sunday, which is my Polish roots, <laughs> Sister Faustina. And the first song that the choir sang was a John Michael Talbot song. And he, is, um, he has a monastery next to my parish <laughs> in Texas. So it was like putting the Irish and the, Polish and the Texas all together, and um, that's part of part of how I knew that this was definitely meant to be. So, this many years later, then um, we began. I began at my parish in Texas, Prince of Peace, which is a very large parish, ten thousand families. Wow! And began it maybe for selfish reasons because I knew that I needed this in my. So, spoke with our pastor and presented to parish council, and then um, got a core group of people together which have, has been marvelous because it's, it definitely takes on a life of its own and it's not something that one person can do. So we began about five years ago and we're getting ready for our pilgrimage, which this year, which we always do something special, uh, Thanksgiving Mass for grandparents on the honor around the 26th of July, the Memorial Day of St. Joachim and St. Anne. So we actually have just had a couple of our um, first planning meetings trying to decide what that will look like this year during the pandemic and because of um, distancing, but I think it's going to be just as beautiful, um, maybe just to have a little different face, and we're going to have it on the um, vigil, on the, at the vigil mass, five o'clock on Saturday, the night before the Memorial Day, and one of the things that we've talked about doing, and I think this is especially beautiful, there was, um, we have a member whose grandchildren were supposed to be baptized in at the end of May, and of course it hasn't occurred yet, so she has asked if maybe they could be baptized during our pilgrimage. We haven't figured out if we're able to do that yet. We're waiting for an answer. But it occurred to me that there are grandchildren who will be present, their children, maybe even um, adults, older grandchildren, who have never seen a baby, a child baptized, and don't, of course, remember their own baptism. Yeah. It, wouldn't that be, it just, beautiful. I think that would be beautiful if we're able to do that. So, um, so that would be a tremendous celebration. Um, so again, back to how we got started. We got, I got started in my own parish, Prince of Peace. And then um, a member of ours who um, moved back to her home parish began there. And then we started, actually, Catherine and another um, woman and I did a, made a road trip at some point <laughs> to um, the Northeast. 
because we, we, we always say, have faith, we'll travel. <laughs> so we go wherever we're called. So we recently, most recently, went to um, a diocese of Miami, asked us to come and give a talk there. And so we, we opened up in the diocese of Miami, and then we were scheduled to go to the diocese of Wichita in March. So that now will be rescheduled to the fall. But we started again with just a few um, ministries and parishes, and now we've expanded to, I think I counted, last count, I think we're in like 24 states. We're working on all 50, <laughs> so we will try to do that. We have then also established a group, a, a wonderful core group of ministry leaders um, across the country, and we now Zoom every Wednesday or every other Wednesday, and um, Get gain strength and ideas and encouragement from each other, and and the ministry leaders amaze me, the um, the ideas that they come up with. So we are all now planning our celebrations for July 26th for our Thanksgiving mass for grandparents, and um, again sharing ideas. We have a newsletter that I think we have about 10,000 people worldwide in our database now, um, and then also we will go. Um, we did a last year a conference in for the whole country of Croatia for all the bishops in Croatia so again I know we're talking about the states but um, worldwide we it's amazing how 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 the association has grown um, so the way to get in touch with us then we have a website that is a work in progress someone listening might be like you know what it just takes one it takes one yeah. email yeah. and one contact and it is definitely a calling, and I have um, grandparents call me all the time, and, and, and with very sad stories, um, they're often struggling yeah. to pass on their faith and heartbroken because, again, they know that this is the only lasting gift that they can leave their grandchildren, uh, their, their, their most important legacy. So um, it, it, it does take, it takes a calling, it, it takes prayers, and sometimes they'll call me and they're, they're very hesitant, they're... I've never done anything like this before. Just um, I'm going to pray about it, think about it, and then they'll call me back and they'll, they're like, okay, I'm in. We need to mobilize. <laughs> so okay. mm -hmm. It is definitely something that is, is needed and, and that God has a hand on. We, we know that because we seem to be blown by the Holy Spirit from, from here to there. And um, I think it, it becomes, I don't think I know, it becomes a vital part of parish life. Um, Catherine taught me a long time ago, we are, there are lots of senior organizations and parishes, but we are so much more in that, than that. We're not a, primarily a prayer group, though. Um, if each group is autonomous, and if that's what they choose to be, they can be. But we are also practical and spiritual and also social. We are not just a social group or any, any one of those, but we are all three put together. And I think that's the beauty of what we do and what distinguishes us from other ministries within the parish. It's also well, we're a resource for the parish, Marla. Yes, definitely. We yeah. and um, we have found that um, in in my parish, they they came to us. We were we have um, children's liturgy of the word, and a team had backed out. There are four teams, and they came to us and said, "Would you agree to be a team?" And we're, we looked at each other. Of course, that's what we do. <laughs> stories we tell stories we spend time with children and and the the team um for the children's literature the work thoroughly loves it and they and the children when they're they know it's the grandparents turn they're like oh it's the grandparents <laughs> so, right so if yeah. if someone's listening and they and they are interested in starting an association in their parish or just have questions the best way to to the first step is to go to the website to go to the website or they can, we have an 800 number in the States and it actually rings to my cell phone. Um, so I can give that to you or we can post it on um, Century 21. Yep. We can. If you would like to do it. But the website is, is very simple. It's just www.catholicgrandparentsassociation.org. And the phone numbers will be on that website too. And, and the worldwide, the numbers in Ireland and England are also on the website. And I will say to the listeners that, um, when I learned of your association, um, which I believe to be a God wink, um, as soon as I reached out, I heard back from both of you. So um, it's, it, you know, thank you for being just so responsive and so excited. And, and I'm sorry, it, I'm sorry, Catherine, it took me 20 years to find you. But I'm <laughs> oh, no. Oh, I'm let go. Honest to God, God never, God always 
lets us catch up. I'm telling you. Yes. Uh, other things we've done, you know, in the last 20 years, you know, the, the, the grandparents' pilgrimage is an enormous thing, of course. The Pope's prayer for grandparents is in 25 languages and in Braille. Um, we have children's prayer appeal. We have something called Bambinelli Sunday. We, again, we, we just stole these ideas, Karen, that we didn't reinvent the wheel. Our Holy Father on Gaudete Sunday, in third Sunday in December in Rome, blesses all the baby Jesuses. And so all the children come, St. Peter's. And so now, nearly all over the world, we have Bambinelli Sunday, we call it. And the children and the schools bring their baby Jesus, and they bless them and they take them home. And guess what? If they haven't got a crib, the mummies and daddies will have to find one because they've got to put baby Jesus on. <laughs> Um, you know, we've had songs written for, for grandparents and grandchildren. We honor and celebrate the longest married grandparents. We well, Tell us about that. The, the, the well, I mean, again, you know, every single country is autonomous, and we are in 53 different countries. And they all come up with incredible ideas. And we share all these ideas. And again, Karen, that's where I see you as been a total, utter godsend. Because we haven't got the facilities and the know-how to get these out. But I just know that you can be a channel for this. Um, basically, we just, you know, um, just tell me what I was saying, Karen. Well, <laughs> we were, I, was, I was so curious when you said the oldest living or oldest married Okay, no, no. okay so um, wow. again, again, when we were starting, you know, I always, we couldn't afford to do any um, advertising. So I would dream up ideas for editorial and <laughs> get it in newspapers. And so I said, well, no, so, okay, so who are the oldest grandparents in the country? And, you know, it's really interesting how families love their grandparents to be honored by something like that. So that age is an honor. It's a badge. It's not an impediment. It is something to be proud of. And we bring that out particularly at our pilgrimages and our Thanksgiving masses. Um, also, the, the people with the, the, the greatest number of grandchildren or great-grandchildren, the ones who've been the longest married. And again, we produce lovely certificates. Um, and normally, they would come to our pilgrimage and they would be honoured. We've been very uh, blessed. I think for the last number of years, the paper nuns here in Ireland has always come to um, our pilgrimages at Knock. And so they present them. But it's just wonderful for the congregation and everybody else who's watching to see how the grandparents are honoured and loved and respected and how much we need them. We really, truly need them. Yes. Every aspect of them to pass on their wisdom and their understanding and their love. I mean, you know yourself that your mother can give you a filthy look. Your grandmother can only give you a everything is fine. <laughs> there, is a, there is a unique relationship between grandparents and grandchildren and sometimes a relationship that's much better than you ever had with your own children. Yes. Because God knows we've all made our mistakes mm -hmm. and it's another opportunity, you know, to, to be the best version of yourself. Yes. Um, I was talking to my granddaughter yesterday and she said, um, she's 18. And she was telling me that her friend told her not to tell her mother something. And I said, Annie, do you know what? Anybody who tells you not to tell your mother something is not a good friend. Mm. Yeah. I said, do you think, just think about that, darling. Just think about that. And don't, 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 you know, anybody who ever said to you, now look, that's a very small thing. Mm -hmm. But I think it'll stick with Annie forever. Exactly. That, like, just that gentle conversation that is a tattoo on her heart. You know, yeah, I mean, she carries Karen, you have to meet them where they're at. Yeah. All your, t all your kids, all your teenage grandchildren, your own brothers and sisters, your own friends, they're all at different points in their lives. Yeah. And if you go in with the jugular every single time, yeah. they won't want to know. Yeah. Whereas if you're totally non-judgmental and understanding, but doesn't mean that you have to love the sinner, you know, love the crime. Um, it, 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 People think, oh, well, you can't, you can't do that now. You, you know, that's not allowed. There's nothing that's not allowed when it comes to mercy and forgiveness and love. And particularly when it's your grandchildren, there is nothing a loving grandparent will not do for their grandchildren. 
And I think that the most important message to your children, to your children as well as to your grandchildren, is keep communication going. Keep the door open. You know, once the words come out of your mouth, you can never put them back in. It's just be, be patient. You know, stop, yeah, stop pumping the children for information when there's divorce involved or an unhappy situation in the family. They don't need that. Mm -hmm. And they don't need to be talking badly about anybody else in the family. So I help them say, do you know what? We won't go there now. We, we, we say a prayer for that person or whatever. But I also think Karen, that one of the reasons I love what you're doing is that it makes you think ahead. And I think that as grandparents, you have to plan ahead a bit so that you can avail yourself of opportunities when they present themselves. Because you might be dying. I mean, I've got one granddaughter waiting to make communion and two for confirmation. And I pray day and night that the opportunity is going to present itself and that I can get them prepared. Um, so I know that whenever there's a chance to bring it up nicely with their parents or the respective people who are in charge, I, I'll say it. Oh, wouldn't it be great? You know, thank God that might happen. Or the, you, you have to be prepared as grandparents for the best and the worst. Yeah, that's good advice. And, you know, um, as we wind down, um, I, I, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, um, I love this quote from Pope Francis, who says, grandparents are a treasure in the family. Please take care of your grandparents, love them, and let them talk to your children. And mm -hmm. it's just a beautiful reminder. Um, I also want to thank you, Catherine, for this, the gift um, that you gave Our Lady, that um, Our Lady gave back to us, and that continues to bear fruit. And for the, the, the beautiful friendship that you share with Marilyn, um, who continues to um, evangelize in a gorgeous way, um, you know, the Catholic Grandparent Association in the United States. Um, and again, I'm going to repeat that it's an international organization. We want more people to know about it, to get involved. Um, my hope is that eventually, when um, we move beyond God's grace in this pandemic, um, that you'll come to Boston and we'll be able to do something at Boston College. And um, again, thank you for um, the inspiration for the launch of our Grace of Grandparents um, campaign. And, and I pray that that continues to bear fruit and uh, look forward to continuing our conversation and um, to really sharing our gorgeous faith with our children and our grandchildren in a time when that's not easy to do. Karen, you know, um, that reminds me of the mission statement of the Catholic Grandparents Association is to help grandparents to pass on the faith and to keep prayer at the heart of family life. And we have a wonderful leader called Catherine um, up in New York. And she told us a story very recently. She went back to Ireland to find her relatives and she got off the bus and directly opposite the bus was the church. And she went into the church and she found where her parents and her grandparents were married. And then she found the church stone. And she stood in front of the church stone and she read. And at the end, she said, she just joined her hands and bowed her head and said, thank you, God. Please don't let it end with me. Beautiful. Beautiful. And I think that don't let it end with me yes. is if that would be the message I would want to pass on. And, it, and, and why would it and why should it? Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> Mar Mar uh, one, just, little, just one little corrector. Marion is far more important than she made out to be. She's very humble. She is the international coordinator for the CGA and my right hand and when my left hand. And when I breathe in, Marilyn breathes out. <laughs> so thank God for putting us together. And Karen, thank God for the gift of you. Yes. You. 
Thanks. 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 Thank you, Karen. Oh, thank you. Look forward to connecting. <laughs> Perfect. God bless you. Take God care. Bless. For more Catholic faith resources, follow us at bc.edu backslash c21 or via Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Mm-hmm.